ladies like this, a lady like this would actually say that. Listen to what, this was actually this morning. On the news, this is what was said. Na National news. Drummer boy at the first Christmas, the answer is... I wasn't there, but I certainly hope so. So the story it is... certainly would have enriched the story. The so let's believe there was. All right, very good. All right, let's listen to that again. There, a drummer boy at the first Christmas. The answer is I wasn't there, but I certainly hope so. So the story it is certainly would have enriched the story. The so story. let's believe there was. All right, very good. Oh well, it, it enriched the story. Let's just believe there was. You know, it just sounds good. Let's just believe there was. How do you miss that, friends? When you look at the text and when you read what the Bible is saying about the the birth of Christ in Luke chapter two. Notice what you've read. You, you can read through this. I'm not going to take the time to read all 20 verses, but you won't find the little drummer boy there. Why is it then people say, well, you know, it sounds good. Let's put it in there. Well, how about that? How about we have, how about we, we, we find the innkeeper going, well, you know what? We actually have a vacancy uh, open. Y'all just move out of the manger and come into the inn. When the Bible says there was no room at the inn. Well, it sounds good. Let's put it in there. You know? Let, let's say, well, you know what? They were hungry. They went down to the steakhouse and ate a steak. Hey, it sounds good. Let's put it in there. I like to think that. Let's put it in there. See, it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when uh, Cyrenus was governor of Syria. And they all went taxed. Come on down to verse uh, 4. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Um, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. All right? Now, there were shepherds there, beginning in verse 8, but the rest of the text just talks about the shepherds coming and finding the newborn babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. Nothing is said about the little drummer boy. See, now, when we look at the text, how is it that we can miss something as big as a drummer boy? I mean, how do we miss that person? Surely, surely if the drummer boy was there, and if, in fact, God wanted us to know that, he would have put it in the story. But he's not there. How do you miss that? Unless it's because you're not careful about how you read. You say, well, I just, you know, I've always heard that there was a little drum boy there. It's always come with Christianity. No, not true Christianity. Christianity that's following the Bible doesn't say, well, there might have been a little drum boy there. Christianity that's following the Bible says, let's go back to the book and find out. No, there was no little drum boy there. Let's don't believe he was there. Let's don't pretend he was there. Let's just feel good about the fact that Christ was born, okay? So, no, there's no little drum boy. How do you miss that? unless you're not careful about how you're reading. Now, it just goes to show you that people aren't real careful because how do you miss this? How do you miss the wise men at the manger? Now, the Bible does say that the wise men came from afar. Notice this in Matthew chapter 2. Uh, Matthew chapter 2. Here we go. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod, the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east, and were come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes people together, he demanded them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Ju and Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. When Herod, then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may... Come and worship him also. Verse 9. And when they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before him, went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with greatest joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, 
and fell down and worshipped them. And when they had opened the treasure, they presented with him unto him gold, gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, twice we hear the young child is there, and then we find him them coming into the house. So how do we miss the fact that these wise men didn't come to the manger? How do we miss that? How is it that every nativity scene you see has the wise men at the manger bringing forth gifts? How do you miss that? When the Bible says the young child and they were in a house. How do you miss that? How do you miss the fact that, that uh, when Herod went to kill all of the children, notice this, uh, ver let's come on down about uh, verse 14. Uh, verse 15. And there was until the death of Herod that he might... Now see, verse 15. I'm sorry, 16. And when Herod saw that he was mocked of the wise men, he was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coast thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had diligently acquired of the wise men. So in other words, the wise men said, we saw this star about two years ago. So Saul, so so Saul, so Herod killed all the children from two years old and under. So by the time the wise men got there, he was indeed a young child. He was a two-year-old child, at least a two-year-old child. So how do you miss that? Unless you're not careful reading. Unless you're not looking at the text carefully. See, how do you miss that? How do you miss that they're at they're, that they're at the house and not in the manger? And how do you get three out of there? How do you get three wise men while we're at it? See, friends, just because there's gold, frankincense, and myrrh, three gifts, doesn't mean that there were three men. Two men could have brought three gifts. Could have been six men. And two of them brought gold, and two of them brought frankincense, and two of them brought myrrh. How do you know? How do we know how many there were? Why three? Why make it a fast rule that there were three? You see, how do you miss that? It's because you're not reading the text. Not reading the text. Now, now, you say, well, that's kind of that's immaterial, doesn't really matter. Well, what about this? Because this definitely makes a, a, a bearing. This next one does because it has to do with a man's salvation. Now, notice this. How do you miss a horse? They say, well, what are we talking about, James? How do you miss a horse? Well, listen to this. Listen to what uh, uh, people are saying. And I know I've heard people on this show, I couldn't find a, the video clip of them saying this. But listen to what this fellow is saying about Saul on the road to Damascus, okay? Listen to what, what he's... Well, what, let's see. I, I missed him here. Scoot him up a little bit. I have a hard time seeing over here. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Acts 9.3 Saul of Tarsus was about to have his name, mission, and life changed forever. He had his way for years persecuting Christians in the name of God. He was zealous for Yahweh in the wrong way. God had plans for him. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Acts 9, 4. That moment came. Saul was knocked off his high horse and blinded, a dreadful event destined for glory. This proud, high-minded, Christian-hating Pharisee encountered the living God in the middle of the road. Imagine that terrifying scene, brilliant light, horse rearing up, Saul flung to the ground. And then he hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Did you hear him? Saul was knocked to the ground. His horse reared up, and he was flung to the ground. Now, wait a minute. Now, I've read Acts chapter 9 quite a few times, and I've read uh, uh, Acts chapter 22, another account of Saul's conversion. I, I've, I've uh, read that quite a few times, but I have never in, in uh, any of those occasions come across a horse. But here we are. Here's a man going, well, there's a horse there. Saul fell off his horse. Well, is that true? Let's look. Let's look at the text. In Acts chapter 9, let's just pick up to where this man uh, was reading. Now, I never heard him read about a horse. 
I just read where, where the Bible says Saul was on his way to Damascus. And in verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou? And the Lord, said, Lord, and the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard that he kick against the pricks. Verse 6, And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Now let's stop there for a moment. How do you miss a horse? Friends, I know, I know that even the casual reader can find a horse in that text. A careful reader will never find a horse. You can look all you want to. You'll never find a horse in that text. So why then do people come along and go, well, there was a horse in that text? Hey, how do you miss a horse? Why is it that people don't have a problem adding something to the Bible? Now, I believe, if you'll notice three times in the Bible, God warns about adding to or taking away from his word. One's in Deuteronomy, one's in Proverbs, and one is in, in Revelation, in the front, in the middle, in the back. But people add a horse, they've added wise men, they've added a, 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 a drummer boy. Now, how do you miss that? Unless you're not very careful reading. So, friends... The, the, the problem that we're having here is people are not being careful. As a matter of fact, I know Saul didn't have a horse because look at this. In verse 8, And Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. Why didn't they just put him back on his horse? I mean, why lead him by the hand? Saul, we're going to lead you by the hand all the way to Damascus. Well, just put me back on my horse, men. Oh, no, we got to lead you in there because, you know, your horse, I don't know, horse spooked off or something, I guess. We might as well add that to the text, too. Horse ran off because the horse was scared. I don't know. Stampede or something. No, put him on his horse. Horse is not there. Now, friends, if you, if you are listening to all this and you're not reading for yourself, no telling what you'll put into the text. I had a lady tell me one time, I said, where's that verse that says cleanliness is next to godliness? She said, oh, it's in the Bible. I said, no, ma'am, it's not. Oh, yes, it is. It's in there. I said, it's not in the Bible. You can look, look for it and find it. Oh, it's in there. No, it's not. Had a man the other day tell me that if you, if you uh, mark, you're talking about uh, born in sin, whatever. This man told me that he said if, if, you, if you are a child of God and you sin, and you don't repent, God will just put you in an early grave so that you can't keep sinning. He'll just take you on to heaven. I said, find, find me that verse. Find me that verse. It's not in there. How do you miss that? That's got to be as at least big as a horse. It's not in there, friends. But yet for some people, people believe that it is. Now, is it the case that you are studying and reading carefully? Or did you just hear your preacher say it and you think it's in there? Now, friends, I know some of you. I know how you. I know how you operate, and what I'm trying to do is open your eyes so that you don't walk around blind. You know, I'm trying to put you on a horse and head you in the right direction, so you don't stumble around blind. But here's what people do: they follow the preacher. Listen to what this lady said. All right, here on what's the Bible say? I go along with Brian Edwards because Brian is a true Christian. Man, He preaches the Bible. His church is a spirit-filled church. His church. And you I go right. along with, with the way that he preaches and gets his message across. Well, ma'am, let me ask you this Blessed question. Blessed are the peacemakers. Ma'am, let me ask you this question. In, in his statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul said, Am I crucified for you? Does Brian, was Brian crucified? Does he really have a church? Well, he preaches the Word of God. Okay, we're going to correct that statement now. You see, that's what we do in what we say. We're constantly helping you. The Bible says he doesn't have a church. He didn't die for anything. But no. actually, blessed hope, he is his church. Anything, Excuse me? But he is a, a spirit-filled preacher. How do you tell that? Because I sit in his service every Sunday. Sounds like you're wedded to him. No, I'm not. Well, is the sinner's prayer that he preaches in the Bible? Yes, it is. Where is it? I'll give you $1,000 tonight if you, can, if you can reference it. Well, he preaches the Bible. 
preaches the Bible. Well, how about he gives it to you? He's your preacher. He preaches. I, I can give that to you. Uh, Go ahead and give it. Go ahead and give it. Go ahead and give it. All right. I'll listen to him. He preaches. Go ahead and give it. I can't do it. You do it. Preacher, do it for me. See, she wasn't reading. She wasn't studying. She can't find a sinner's prayer, but she's heard him preach it. Oh, he preaches right out of the Bible. I know, I know it's in the Bible because he preaches it. She hasn't found it in the Bible. She hasn't looked for it in the Bible. So she's just going on what a preacher said. Well, her preacher might tell her, next thing you know, the preacher might tell her there's a horse there in the Bible somewhere. No, friends, you've got to read it yourself. You've got to study yourself. That's why we're saying open your Bibles. Don't take our word for it. You know, you can take your notes. Jot it down. We'll give you a DVD. You can go back and listen to it again. Why? Because we don't want you to take what we say. We want you to study. We don't want you to do like your preacher, like you've been doing your preacher. We want you to question him too. See, the problem is you're not studying. You're not carefully reading. You're not taking heed how you read. And so you're letting the preacher tell you there's a drummer boy and a horse all in the text there and a sinner's prayer. And Oh, I'm not going to be able to find it, but I know it's in there because I heard the preacher say it. Well, the preacher might tell you there's the, the Bigfoot's in the Bible too, and I guess you're going to believe that too. Well, I've heard him say it. Why don't you find it for yourself, friends? See, be careful. Be careful how you, how you read. Take heed how you read. Now, let's think about this. How do you miss that? Friends, there's a lot of things that you're missing because you're not carefully reading the Bible. Now, let's talk about the thief on the cross. Everybody likes thief on the cross. But I want to show you something about thief on the cross that you missed. Obviously, you missed. I don't know how you missed it, but you missed it. Now, look at this. In Luke 23, verse 42. The thief said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, all of you out there who don't want to obey the truth, you won't always bring up the thief on the cross. Well, what about the thief on the cross? He wasn't baptized. What about the thief on the cross? Well, what about him? You know what? You haven't been reading carefully because you missed something. And I don't know how you missed it because it's 43 days big. He said, what do you mean 43 days men? You missed it by a month or better. Here's what I mean. Here's what I mean. Look at this. Jesus said in Mark 16, 15 and 16, he said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, when did Jesus give this command? When did Jesus give this command? It was after he was resurrected. Let's look. Let's look. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Now, when did Jesus say this? Jesus gave this command right when he was ready to go back up into heaven, right when he was ready to ascend. He was ready to go back up into heaven, and this, so this was at the end of 40 days. Now, how do I know 40 days? Well, let's look at this. In Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, I missed my uh, thing there. Here's what uh, Luke says. Luke writes, he says, The former treatise have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. All right? How long was he with them? Verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So 40 days after he was raised from the grave. Well, he's in the grave three. So 43 days after the thief on the cross, he tells his disciples to go into all the world and teach the gospel. He tells them to baptize. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He tells them to baptize anyone who believes and is baptized shall be saved. So 43 days 
after the thief on the cross is when Jesus gives the command to, uh, 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 to go to all the world to preach the gospel. 43 days later, he tells them to uh, go into all the world with the Great Commission and gives the command to be baptized for the remission of sins. But you missed it. See, but you missed it. You missed it because you haven't been carefully reading. Matthew, uh, Luke 23, where the thief on the cross says, remember when you come to your kingdom, is 43 days prior to this command. Now, friends, there's no way the thief on the cross could obey this. He's dead. He'd been dead for 43 days. And he's still in the grave. How in the world would you expect him to obey that command? See? But because you're not reading carefully, because you're not taking heed how you read, you want to run back to the thief on the cross. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't think God expects someone who's been dead 43 days to obey this gospel. See that? Now, what about this? God said build an ark. Are you building an ark? You say, no, I'm not building an ark. That was way back in Noah's day. Well, I don't care. You expect a thief on the cross to be baptized 43 days after the, uh, 43 days, when he's dead, 43 days. I expect you to build an ark, you know, five from 5,000 years ago, a command that took place 5,000 years ago. I mean, what's the difference? See, friends, what you need to realize is this command was for people who were living after the cross. It was for people who were going to be living in the gospel dispensation. The thief on the cross would not qualify. Now, why? Why don't you? How, how did you miss that? How did you miss that? Something so big as a whole month, 43 days, and you missed it. You know why? Because you've been listening to your preacher, and you hadn't opened your Bible, and you hadn't been studying it, and you hadn't, you hadn't been asking yourself, now, why is it? That these guys on TV tell us you must be baptized when the thief on the cross wasn't. Why is it? Figure it out. Here it is right here, friends. The thief was not amenable to this command. He was already dead. But you missed it. You know why? Because you haven't been looking carefully at the text. Oh, they, 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 you believe there's a horse in there. You believe there's a little drummer boy in there. You believe there's a sinner's prayer in there. You believe everything that's not in the Bible is in the Bible, but the things that are in the Bible, you say are not in the Bible. Now, something's wrong with that, friends. Something's wrong with that. All right, Scotty, go ahead and put the phone num uh, numbers up, if you would, please. All right, how do you miss that? How do you miss that? How do you miss this? Peter's words. In Acts 2, verse 38, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized. Everyone is using the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, how do you miss that? Now, I, I know that's a little word there, and this is not a very big phrase, but how do you miss that? You can see that horse that's not there. You see that drummer boy that's not there. Right? You see that sinner's prayer that's not there. But then you want to pass over, and you want to turn your head when it comes to this Phrase, for the remission of sins. Oh, I, I'm going to miss that. How do you miss that? How do you miss that, friends? It must be because you're listening to your preacher and you're not listening to the Bible. Friends, Peter says, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, both of these things come before remission of sins. Just like Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Believe and, and baptism comes before remission of sins. So repentance and baptism comes before the remission of sins. So what does that mean? That tells me that belief and repentance and baptism come before the remission of sins. Now, you know why you miss that? Because you, you haven't been reading. And I know your preacher hadn't told you this because, uh, because he doesn't believe it. Now, you, you're dedicated to your preacher so much. If he had told you this, you'd probably believed it. We're showing it to you out of the Bible, and you don't believe it. Why is that? How did you miss that? How did you miss that? A blind man can see that. See that? How do you miss that? This same phrase, by the way, Matthew 26, uh, 
um, Acts 2.38 is the same phrase in Matthew 26 and verse 28. Notice this. Jesus says, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, whatever Jesus' blood was shed for is the same thing that repentance and baptism is for. Jesus shed his blood so that the sins of the world could be remitted for the remission of sins in order that the sins might be forgiven. So it is when Peter said, repent and be baptized, it's for the remission of sins. How did you miss that? How did you miss that? You can see that horse that's not there, but you can't see this. Must be because you don't want to see it. Must be because you don't want to see it. All right? What about these words? What about these words? In 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, Peter says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Baptism doth also now save us. How do you miss that? How do you miss that? I hear people all the time say, well, baptism doesn't save. It's a command, but it doesn't save. Listen to, uh, let me see if I pull up this, uh, uh, <clears throat> this, this video clip here. This is some of the local preachers. And uh, they're, they're trying to give uh, some information on baptism. All right, let's see. Right here we go. I believe, but if you in your heart rebel whenever the commandment is there, it is commandment, repent and be baptized. It is commandment, repent and be baptized. It is commandment, repent and be baptized. But uh, if you rebel in your heart against baptism, you possibly could be lost. You possibly could be lost. You possibly could be lost for, through that. All right. Here, he says it, it's, a, it's a command. I believe, but if you in your heart rebel whenever it, the commandment is there, it is commandment. Repent and be baptized. It is commandment. Repent and be baptized. It is commandment. Repent and be baptized. But uh, if you rebel in your heart against baptism, you possibly could be lost. You possibly could be lost. You possibly could be lost for, through that. You probably could be lost if you rebel. You don't have to be baptized even though it's a command, but you possibly could be lost if you rebel against that command. Now, which is it, friends? Are you going to be lost if you, if you disobey a command? Yes. Baptism is a command. Therefore, if you are not baptized, you'll be lost. No, you'll just probably be lost. Now, which is it, friends? How do you miss that? How do you miss baptism is, is essential to salvation when Peter says it doth also now save us? He said in Acts 2, verse 38, that it is for the remission of sins. And then you have in Acts 22, verse 16, uh, verse 16 Saul is told, why tearest thou, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling the name of the Lord. Now, why do you think that baptism is not, is not essential? How do, you, how do you miss that? How do you miss that? That's, that's bigger than a horse. You know? If you can find a horse, surely you can see this, friends. Or is it that you just don't want to? Now, friends, we love you so much, we're trying to tell you the truth. We love you so much that we want you to go ask your preacher about this. We love you so much that we're willing to open the phone lines and let you ask us questions about, about what we're teaching. We love you so much we'll come out and have a Bible study with you. You know, but your preacher won't, won't sit down and have a Bible study with you. And me. He might sit down and talk to you, but he won't sit down and talk to me and you. I'll sit down and talk to you and your preacher. I'll, I'll sit down and talk to you and your preacher or anybody else that you want to talk to and ask these questions. You know why? Because I'm confident in what we're saying. 
And I know that when something is so plain in the Bible, I'm not going to miss it. Now, you have to have help to overlook that. You have to have help to overlook that. How do you miss that? How do you miss it? All right. Well, let's look again. Here's something else that people have missed. Get back over here. I don't like this thing. All right. Uh, how, what about the Ephesians? Now someone said, well, let's skip on to Ephesians 2 verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of God. Not of works that didn't mention both. Well, friends, that's, that's, that's a very nice verse. I like that verse. I have no problem with that verse. I preach that verse. For by grace you're saved through faith. But it's not faith only. Most people quote this verse to say, well, you're not baptized. Nothing in that verse about baptism. No, nothing in that verse about repentance either. Nothing in that verse about confessing Christ either. Does that mean it's not important? See, friends, what you need to do is you need to read everything about the Ephesians. The Ephesians have already obeyed the gospel. Here is their account in Acts 19, verses 1 through 5. I think we went over this a couple weeks ago. But look at this. In Acts 19, here comes the Apostle Paul. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto them, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Then John, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, friends, how do you miss that? How do you miss that? When you're talking about the Ephesians, you don't need to go to Ephesians 2, verse 8, to find out how to be saved. These folks have already obeyed the gospel. And they learned the gospel in Acts 19. And they believed in baptism so much that they were baptized twice, once, it was an invalid baptism, John's baptism. It was looking forward to Christ. And the second time, it was with the gospel baptism, believing on Christ who had already come. So they, they looked at baptism and said, it's definitely essential to my salvation to the point that they didn't rebel and buck and say, well, I've been baptized. They realized, you know what, I've been baptized wrong. I was taught wrong. I was baptized wrong. I need to be taught right and be baptized right. How do you miss that? You know how you miss this? You know how you miss Acts 19? Because your preacher tells you to stay out of Acts. Your preacher tells you, well, Acts is a transitional book. You need to stay out of Acts. Don't get your doctrine from Acts. So that's the problem. He's, telling, he's basically telling you to stay out of one book of the Bible. Now, why would you do that, friends? Why, why would a preacher tell you that? Stay out of that book. Why would a preacher tell you to stay out of that book? Stay out of the book of Acts. It's in the New Testament. Why stay out of it? Why stay out of it? You know why? Because if you get in the book of Acts, all your Baptist doctrine is going to come unraveled. Now, how did you miss this? You know how you missed Acts 19? You started listening to your preacher. You stopped reading the Bible for yourself. You know, there was a time... Friends, when people wanted to read the Bible for themselves, the Catholic Church said, no, you can't do it. Nobody can read the Bible but the priest, the clergy. See? All you little people out in the pew, you can't read the Bible. Now, here we are. We've come full circle to the point that now we have Bibles all over the place. You can get them on your computer. You probably got one or two or three in your house. Now you have the Bible at your disposal, and you go, well, I'm not going to read it. I'm going to let the preacher read it for me. You're going back to the Catholic Church. You might as well go back and be a Catholic. Let them read the Bible to you. That's what you're doing. You know how you miss this? 
You miss it because, because you won't read the Bible. How do you miss that? You don't mind seeing that horse in there. The little drummer boy. But you know what? I'm you, wild, But Paul's wild horse can't get me to read the Bible. What about this big word right here? What about this word not? How do you miss that? How do people read miss not? James 2 verse 24. James says, You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. But every time we talk about salvation, every time we talk about salvation, we see that we see, we see that little phrase, uh, uh, only, you know. Uh, we hear people say, well, there's thousands of, thousands of verses that talk about uh, faith only. Let's see if we can find A.C. Smith here. And so my question, we have thousands of verses that promise salvation based upon grace through faith only. Are we going to ignore all of those verses and interpret them in light of this and a couple of other um, uh, passages that relate to baptism, a couple of other verses on baptism? Aren't we going to just take the plain meaning of Scripture, the overwhelming number of promises of salvation that are based upon grace through faith? How much more? All right. How do you miss that? How do you miss that? I then want to note the vast and overwhelming number of verses that teach salvation by faith only. And so my question, we have thousands of verses that promise salvation based upon grace through faith only. And so my question, we have thousands of verses that promise salvation based upon grace through faith only. I then want to note the vast and overwhelming number of verses that teach salvation by faith only. And so my question, we have thousands of verses that promise salvation based upon grace through faith only. And so my question, we have thousands of verses that promise salvation based upon grace through faith only. Only, And so my question, we have thousands of verses that promise salvation based upon grace through faith only. Are we going to ignore all of those verses? Now, 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 how do you miss that, folks? I then want how, how do you miss that? How do you miss, ja of all the verses he looked upon faith, how do you miss this verse? Not by faith only. How do you miss that? How do, you, how do you miss that? Now, later on, you know what it says about the thousand, the thousand verses? Here he goes. Well, this is my problem with the Church of Christ plan of salvation. It's not found at any one point in Scripture. Salvation, I believe, and I believe the Scriptures do clearly teach this, salvation comes to us at the point of faith. Now, I know previously when I was on a statement of hyperbole where I mentioned that faith only was found thousands of times in the Bible, literally it's not found like that. But let me explain. They're not literally thousands of verses that say, quote, faith only, unquote. But nonetheless, I do believe that we find scores of verses where it says, quote, faith, unquote, and there's nothing else. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say faith, quote, quote, faith, unquote, faith, and nothing else. It says faith. But here is one. Let's quote this one. Not by faith only. Quote, not by faith only, end quote. There's one verse that says not by faith only. There's only one verse that says faith only. And it has a big not right in front of it. How do you miss that? How do you miss that, friends? I mean, if you can see that horse that's not there, surely you can see this big knot. You have to have help missing that. 
You have to help not to see that. And the help that you're getting is from guys like A.C. Smith and Brian Edwards and all these other preachers that you're listening to who are simply telling you and you're going, oh, I heard my preacher say it. My preacher preaches from the Bible. Therefore, it's in the Bible. You better watch it. Your preacher is going to get up and tell you something like, you need to tithe 10% in order to get to heaven and you're going to be doing it. Oh, well, well, I guess they already do that, don't they? Because you, you've been missing it. See, you need help not seeing that. You, you need help to overlook this. Now, why is it, friends, that you're not studying the Bible? Why is it that you're not willing <clears throat> to look and study for yourself? How'd you miss that? How'd you miss that? Again, I find it amazing that all these people can claim to read their Bible, claim to study their Bible, claim to hear their preacher preaching out of the Bible, yet when we ask for something that's in the Bible, they can't find it. That's just like the Baptist church or the Methodist church. Can you find it in the Bible? Can you show me the kind of church you're in in the Bible? You can't do it. But yet you want us to believe that it's in there. You want us to believe that, uh, that you're in a church that's in the Bible when, when you can't find it. Well, if I believe that, then I'd have to believe that horse. See? I'd, ha I'd have to believe that. Uh, <clears throat> Let's see if I can find this uh, clip right here. Trying to find this one. Well, I can't find the one I'm looking for there. But <clears throat> uh, had, had a gentleman call in not too long ago and said, you know, the that the that the Bibles that all these Baptist churches have the Bible in them. Friends, that's not the same as having the Baptist church in the Bible. You know, you can say, well, I, I've got a barn and I've got a horse. Well, that don't mean the horse is in the barn. See? So, how, how do you miss this? It must be because you, you have help. Now, friends, I know we're about wrapping up out of time, so let me ask you this. How can you see this? Why is it that you can see a drummer boy? Why is it you can see three wise men coming to a manger? Why is it you can see a drummer boy and three men and a horse when it's not in the Bible? I'll tell you why. You can see all these things that are not in the Bible the same reason you can see the sinner's prayer, the uh, Methodist church, the Lutheran church, the Presbyterian church, the Apostolic church. That's why you, see, you can see them in the Bible. Same reason you see that big horse in the Bible. Because you're not looking, friends. You're not being careful how you read. How do you miss that? How do you miss it and say all these things are in the Bible? The reason you miss it, friends, is because you're not studying for yourself. But we want to encourage you. We want to encourage you to open the Bible, make sure that what you're being told is indeed in the Bible. Make sure that what you're being told can be backed up with Scripture. I've had people tell me countless times that the reason why they obeyed the gospel is because they Listen to our program. They followed along in the Bible, and they found out that everything we're saying is right in the Bible. Now, friend, I know your preacher can't do that. I know your preacher can't do it. And I'll help you find the truth in the Bible. And if you find that your church in the Bible, if you show me, you'll be doing me a favor. Come on. You need some help. I know you need some help. If you see these things in the Bible when they're not there, you definitely need some help. I'll let you use my glasses if it'll help you. But I definitely want to help you to see the truth that's in the Bible. Friends, before we go, I want to make this one announcement. Be looking forward to this. There's an apostolic preacher in Raleigh, North Carolina, that is, has agreed to come on and have a debate uh, probably toward the end of January. I know that's two months away, but I want you to be thinking about that. Be watching for it. Be listening for it. We'll keep you up to date on it. 
uh, you know, sometimes you have to go outside the area to find preachers because all these preachers around here won't give an answer. But um, this fellow says he wants to debate. He would like to have a debate. So that's what we're going to try to do for you and bring that, bring that to your attention uh, just to be looking for it. Friends, thanks for watching tonight. We hope that we've helped you to uh, open your eyes and open your Bible and encourage you to open the Bible. Remember to ask, what does the Bible say? And you always get a word from the Lord, and then you can do your own religious review. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. In digital, WGSR 47.1.